Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're down to the final 10 games of the NHL regular season this year, and finally a last couple games that matter. As as always, it's Dan here alongside Matt. How you doing, Matt? Pumped up. It was a good game last night. It's been an interesting week for the Flames in general. Um, started out the week since we talked last, and a bit of a rough start. They lost 4 nothing to St. Louis. Came back and won the Flyers game. To me, that was quite an entertaining game. I watched most of that game, and I, I was one of my favorite games to watch. Maybe not the best Flames hockey, but... Just the energy you could kind of feel coming through the TV on that one from the Flames. I really enjoyed watching it. Mm-hmm. Then we had the Saturday game. The Blue Jackets were in town to take on the Flames in a matinee. And we know this team has never ver- done very well in matinee games. I know you weren't there. Um, I was there. I don't know if it came through and you watched it on TV. But to me, the officiating of that game was horrible. Well, the officiating has really been somewhat questionable, extending all the way back to the Colorado game in Denver 10 days ago. Lots of hooking and holding and a bunch of things that would normally be called a couple months ago, even, that are just getting let go. Like, even last night, uh, Juris was hit into the, the goal net which was blatant interference, and yet that wasn't even called a penalty. Yeah, no, and I mean in the in the uh, Blue Jackets game, there was penalties that should have been called and weren't. There was what should have, I think, and most people thought should have been a penalty shot for Goudreau and wasn't. Um, people were getting away with stuff they wouldn't have. So it's kind of weird, like you said, that things seem to have shifted, and yeah, the officiating standard seems to have changed. I don't know if that came down from the league or if the officials are just getting i don't want to say lazy but choosing what they want to call late in the season well like i have no problem with calling it more of a playoff style game it's just you'd like some consistency in that regard and i not seeing a lot of consistency at all in the last few weeks no, for sure, and and that's the thing. It seems like every set of referees is calling things differently, and I know over the last couple of years that was something the NHL was really trying to get away from, and trying to get everybody to call things pretty much very you know by the book, and so everyone has the same standard. So, hopefully, the NHL is looking into this, and we'll figure out what they can do about it in the off season. Yeah, and that's not us complaining about the refereeing. Like the Flames won and lost games legitimately. Uh, according to their own play it's just you'd like to see things be more standardized so that way like neither team can have an excuse at the end of the night for why things might not have went their way yeah well and also so you know what's acceptable and what's not you know like okay if everyone's gonna let the you know hits the head go then let's let that be known so we know what we can and can't do exactly you know, if you're going to let boarding go, then let's let that known so that we know what we can and can't do. But not these things that tend to shift and change between games or even, you know, inside of one game. Mm-hmm. Fun times. And then we wrapped up this week of Flames Hockey with our uh, win last night against the Avalanche. Were you at that game? Yes, I was. What did you it, think of that one? It was good. The Flames, they were trying to play a lot more defensively responsible and like i noticed that at times uh, the flames especially in the third period had four players stacked on the blue line and uh, with only the one four checker so we were definitely employing the trap i thought it was interesting too that uh, the first goal came from tangay i thought that was that was apt for the the tangay again pairing yeah and it's good that we ended their season effectively. There are eight points out of a playoff spot with ten games to go, and that's a little too much. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I was really hoping we would have got the two points on Saturday in the matinee as well because I think the Flames needed those. But I'm glad we got at least the two points against Colorado because if we didn't, I think that we'd be in a rough spot right now. Well, the Flames still control their destiny, and as long as they can keep winning and hope for Los Angeles to start losing some games, 
then everything will be fine. It's once the Flames start losing, then that's when the problems occur. And right now, where it's uh, March 24th as we record this, as of the current standings, the Flames are currently third in the Pacific Division, so they're out of the wildcard spot. They are eighth in the Western Conference, and they're two points up on L.A. at this point. So, yeah, we need to keep winning, and we need L.A. to run into some hot teams. Um, but, you know, you were saying before we came on the show, this might be a season that comes down to the last game of the year, which would be kind of fun. Yeah, and a lot more will be sorted out between now and the next show. Uh, the LA Kings, they play the Rangers, Islanders, Blackhawks, and Wild. And while we play the Stars, Predators, the Wild, and the Stars again. So... We have a little bit of an easier week ahead of us, so if L.A. can start dropping a few, we might get some insurance room in there. And that'd be nice, is to not have it come down to the last game. What I'd hate is if we win our last game, and then we're waiting for somebody else to finish out their season to decide our fate. Yeah, uh, that's the worst case scenario for me. (laughs) Because you know how that usually turns out. (laughs) Yeah, it usually doesn't turn out in your favor. Looking at this week, uh, a couple of stories that I thought were kind of interesting to bring up is uh, the depth scoring. Um, We saw early this year we were getting a lot of scoring from, you know, the second and third line. And it seems like over the past week, some of those players that we've been looking at in the past weren't really performing well. And we saw in Colorado, I think, a better offensive performance from the team as a whole. You know, we saw David Jones... Marcus Granlin, some of those uh, lower end, I wouldn't say lower end, but lower on the roster players um, coming out and giving us a better offensive game. Yeah, like if you look at all the secondary scoring for Calgary uh, heading into last night, only four forwards out of all the various guys the Flames have deployed this year have more than 10 goals, and that's not exactly a good thing especially with Lance Boma leading it with only 13 heading into last night Jones with his goal ended up matching him and Boma with his game winner pushed it to 14 but you usually need five or six guys in addition to your first line and Boma's also on a career year this year I think you were saying the best year he's had since he turned pro even in the AHL He's got 30 points and 14 goals this year. Actually, that extends all the way back to his best from juniors as well. Oh, he wow. only had 14 in his uh, the year after he was drafted. Crazy. Good for him. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if you would have asked me at the beginning of the year who I thought would have a career year as far as goals and points, I would not have pointed to Lance Boma. No, he's been Mr. Everything for the Flames this year. For sure, yeah. It's, and it's been great to watch. You know, I think he's becoming one of those guys. I'm seeing more Boma jerseys around the Dome now. I think he's becoming one of those fan favorites, the guy who works hard, and as such, the fans are starting to really get behind. And, you know, we're talking about secondary scoring. I think that if this team is going to make the postseason, we have to have all four lines contributing offensively. You're not going to get very far in the postseason if you've got three, maybe six forwards doing all the heavy lifting. Yeah, especially if the Flames head out on the road for four games. Uh, The other team's going to sick their first line defensemen and their shutdown forwards against the Gaudreau line and say, hey, if we get these guys, keep them off the score sheet, we can handle everybody else. Especially if it's the Ducks, you need all the scoring mites you can get against them. Anybody, really. (laughs) Um, Another story from this week, I think, is the continued... Uh, play of Kerry Ramo. We talked about this around the deadline and the last big road trip that we went on, but every day Ramo's playing in the net, he's making it harder and harder for the Flames not to re-sign this guy in the summer. I can't argue there, although I think in heading into the next contest against Dallas tomorrow, I think the Flames should go back with Hiller. When Ramo gets too many games in a row, I find that he starts sliding around too much and over committing on shots. And that's actually how Colorado scored both their goals yesterday was that Ramo put himself out of position. It's not a huge deal. It's just, you know, we do have a good 
second goalie, so hopefully Hiller gets the start. You know, I like that phrase, second goalie. He's not really the backup. He's just the goalie who's not playing right now. Exactly. And it's a luxury that the Flames have that we have two guys that are equally good. So when the other guy starts getting a little less good from too much work, you can just throw the other guy back in and have a good goalie in that. We also see the Stars twice in a week, so I think it would make sense to play one goalie tomorrow and the other guy on Monday so that they're not able to you know, study the tape between them and see the same goalie twice. Exactly. And because we see them, the second game is uh, Sunday, Monday, back-to-back, um, I think it would make sense, yeah, maybe play Hiller for the next three and then put Rama in on the back-to-back. And, you know, I think that the fact we have that goalie tandem that we do, if the Flames make the postseason this year is going to be one of our strongest strengths going into the postseason. Is Every year you see some team that falters because their goalie gets hurt. I mean, if I think back over the past five years, I think every year I can think of one. So I think that's really going to help us this year is if one of our goalies gets hurt, it's not like, oh, crap, it was Kipper and he's hurt and we got, what, McElhaney attend the net? Like, you know, I think we're, yeah. we have a lot of depth there, which is going to be fantastic. Well, last year, Tampa Bay lost Bishop in the last week, and exactly. they got swept by Montreal. And then you look at Pittsburgh, and Mark Andre Fleury was not good as per usual in the postseason. And if they had a good secondary goalie, things might have went differently for them. Yeah. So I think that you know, even if and I mean, the other nice thing about it too is you can throw a team off. You know, I mean, let's say we end up playing the Ducks. You could rotate the goalies every other, play one at home, one on the road, but I think it makes them stay on their toes a bit more because they're going to have to pay attention to two goaltenders, not knowing who's going to be in the net. Yeah, well, plus it mix, mixes up the timing because you, you would know the tendencies of a guy like, say, Hiller if you play him all the time, and like, oh, he doesn't have a good glove per se or whatever. Well, especially the Ducks know Hiller well as well. Yeah, so you could switch it up, have Ramo in there so they're not used to shooting. It just throws it off a little bit. And it, when it comes to the playoffs, one goal can make all the difference in the series. I think, too, we've talked a lot about the goalies this year, but uh, one thing we've neglected to talk much about was the change in goalie coach this year. Um, as everyone knows, we had Clint Malarchuk for a number of years. He was the coach previously, and this year it's former NHL goaltender Jordan Siglett who's taken over in that role, and I wasn't sure what to expect of him at the beginning of this season. I mean, he's a goalie who's been around the NHL for a while. He never really had great NHL numbers, but, you know, most of the good coaches don't. But he seems like he's doing a good job. Yeah, I have nothing to complain about from any of the coaching staff. They've done a top-notch job. I mean, if I was going to have a goalie coach job, I would want Siglitz because you've got two great goaltenders. Not like you're trying to, you know, bring one guy up. Um, you know, I imagine it's a fairly easy job to coach these two. Oh, yeah. Well, anytime you get quality professionals, it makes your life a little bit easier. Yeah, I think the real test there is going to be seen next year with a guy like uh, Yoni Ordio if he's brought up to the team and how well, you know, Siglitz works with a young goaltender like that over the long term. Another interesting note about the past week I uh, just thought I'd share is I went to the game on Saturday uh, against the Blue Jackets, and I was sitting right next to a, a grandfather and his uh, grandson who came in from Columbus. They flew all the way down here um, at spring breaks. So they were following their team. They went to the game Columbus and Edmonton beforehand, and I apologized to him that their first experience in Canada was in Edmonton. And then they came down here to Calgary, and... Um, Interesting to hear feedback about our team from people outside of our market or don't follow the team as closely as we do. And some of the things that they were saying is every time Calgary comes to Columbus, they'd make sure they try to get tickets. And, you know, they'll pay a lot for those tickets because the Flames are such an interesting team to watch. They know that we're going to give them a good show. They said, it, you know, it doesn't matter how the Blue Jackets do, but you know the Flames are going to bring out the best in them and give a good show. So good to hear that from people in another market. I always find it interesting to hear what people think of us true and usually it's a automatic win night for the blue jackets against the flames in columbus i think the flames have dropped seven or eight in a row there or something like that starting to become like the next honda center yeah we're gonna have to start winning on the road 
Uh, well, with the last week behind us then, why don't we look ahead and uh, look to some of the future of the Flames. Um, two interesting signings within the Flames organization this past week. The first one made a lot of headlines when the Flames signed one of the top contested college free agents this year, Kenny Morrison, a uh, defenseman from the West Michigan University Broncos. Um, when I was looking around online at this guy, even on Sportsnet, guys like Roger Millions said that Morrison's considered the hottest defensive player in the NCAA. He has a very pro-style shot, very physical and outstanding. So right when you read right when you read that, you know that there's a kid that's going to be a flame-style player. He's 6'2", 205, a big boy. Um, what are your thoughts on Morrison? Anytime you can add a right-shooting defenseman with a bomb of a slap shot who's quick and good defensively, for nothing just signing him as a free agent that is nothing but a win and Calgary's defensive system we have quite a few diamond in the rough type guys like Kulak, Culkin, Waterspoon, Seeloff, Hickey but nobody that's a for sure likely top four guy and I think Morrison might eventually become that for the Flames who knows but at least the Flames are taking steps to address the lack of upper end talent um, on the blue line Calgary does have quite a few forward prospects but not a lot in the line of defense yeah, and I mean, that's something we've talked about this season on the show as well is, you know, the Flames have spent a lot of time upgrading their forward depth as far as prospects go, and there's still some work to be done on the blue line. And like you said, there's a lot of guys that might make it. There's a lot of guys that might be kind of fringe guys. Um, but I think that the only for sure that probably the guy will make the NHL on a regular basis if he wants to is Tyler Watherspoon. So it's nice to see that we've got someone else there. Yeah, he's probably the highly touted defensive player. Yeah, and he was the number one free agent. Him and uh, Casey Bailey, who attended the Flames development camp, were the top forward and the top defenseman. So hopefully Morrison, once he finishes up his uh, academic portion of his career, I think he's going to be finished his testing next week. Uh, he can join Adirondack and push forward. And, you know, I was skimming through just a quick interview with him and the son, and uh, he was mentioning Josh Juris and, you know, some of the college players the Flames have signed and had success with. So it's nice to see the guys starting to think about Calgary as a very development-friendly market, especially for students. Well, if you treat players fairly and give them a shot, even if they're not your guys, like your draft picks, th that helps. And you might be able to attract free agents and NCAA guys and other players from different avenues. Anything that can make your team better organizationally is nothing but a good thing for the long term. See, you said something there, too, that I've disagreed with for a while. This idea of these are our guys because we drafted them. To me, someone can be your guy whether you draft them or not. I mean, look here at Jerome McGinley. For so many years, people would call him a Flames guy. You know, he was the Flames guy. He was drafted by the Stars. You know, look at Kippersoff. He was the Flames guy. He was drafted by another organization. So, to me, I think people need to stop putting so much emphasis on who did we draft or who did we not. Giordano didn't draft him. So, I think it's more about... Yeah, what are they doing for you as opposed to how did they come and are they ours or not from the beginning? Oh, I know. It's just naturally a lot of teams are biased towards their own guys and might overvalue them. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Yeah, a lot of teams do that. And, like, I agree with you what you said wholeheartedly. It's just, it's the nature of things. And, like, if you've spent, like, three or four years drafting and developing a guy you might have a little bit more bias towards that guy. So Calgary not having that bias and just focusing on the actual results from that player is a good thing. For sure. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is, you know, you didn't spend you didn't spend all the time drafting this guy and people didn't get attached to him by watching them, you know, for for a whole season as much. So I can see where the bias comes from. 
Just a little bit more information about Morris. He's a native of Lloydminster, Alberta, so another big Alberta boy. Uh, he's played three seasons with the WMU Broncos between the NCHC and the CCHA. In 37 games this year, uh, the six foot three, 208-pound defenseman has netted five goals, 10 assists for 15 points in 36 penalty minutes. His career-high college numbers were 54 points, 16 goals, and 38 assists in 151 penalty minutes. So sounds like the kind of guy I want to be on the Flames blue line, a big kid who can move the puck and uh, knows how to get physical when he needs to. Yeah, and a comparable is uh, Danny DeKaiser, who plays for Detroit. He played in the same system that Morrison is, and Morrison only had three less points in his college career than DeKaiser, and DeKaiser is currently a first-pairing defenseman for Detroit. Now, Morrison's not has not been rated as good of a prospect in terms of overall talent as the Kaiser, but it's close. So the Flames got a good player out of the deal. I think Morrison might almost get more of a chance in our organization than he might than De Kaiser might have. I mean, De Kaiser, you know, going to Detroit was looked at highly, but I think there's going to be a guy who's a one-two guy in the HL next year. So I think he's going to have all the chance in the world to uh, to improve. Exactly, and the Flames will make room if he comes into the development camp and training camp next year and blows their socks off. He will get a opening day roster spot. Oh, for sure, yeah, and and I mean on defense, we have a lot of room to maneuver there. Exactly, uh, Adirondack also signed a free agent uh, Oleg Yavenko, another defenseman, a six foot seven guy that plays in the same style as Keegan Kanzig. Now this is an amateur tryout agreement, right? So he doesn't count against the Flames roster spot, nor is he on uh, Calgary Flames payroll. He's simply an Adirondack Flames hire. Yes, and it's kind of one of those things where we sign you for the rest of the year to be an Adirondack player. And if we like what you're doing, we'll give you a contract. Because I think that's what the Flames did. Or at least did. a call to camp. Yeah, I think that's what the Flames did with Brady Lamb a couple of years ago uh, when he played for Abbotsford. He signed a PTO for the balance, and then the Flames signed him after that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, he's he's in the AHL. The AHL needs some bodies right now because we t- keep taking theirs. So bring bring the kid in. He's 24, uh, six foot. Uh, six foot seven and 250 pounds, so a big defenseman. Um, and yeah, if he looks good, I wouldn't even say give him a contract, but bring him back to camp. Yeah, and we'll see. Uh, anytime you can add more big bodies into the system, like uh, the Flames are likely going to be losing Nolan Yonkman next year. So uh, if Yavinko can come in and kind of take that position of being the big physical defenseman that would help yeah i think we're gonna see and i mean we'll talk about rfas and ufas in the coming episode but i think we're gonna see some turnover on the blue line i think potter will be gone i think yonkman will be gone and i think that canary will be gone so definitely some spots there for some new guys to move in Mm -hmm. um and if we look at if we look at Yavanko, he actually made it to the uh, Worlds last year. He played for Team Belarus, which is where he's from. So I didn't look at the roster there, but I imagine one of the uh, probably better players in that roster. There's not a lot of Belarusian guys still in the NHL. And currently he's playing in the States, which is kind of weird. He's playing for UMass. Uh, you don't see a lot of um, guys from you know Europe come over to play in the American college hockey. And in 36 games this year, he has zero goals, five assists, and and, uh, five points total, and 51 penalty minutes. He's a plus-minus negative 25. Yeah, well, I do believe his team was one of the bottom teams in the NCAA, so I wouldn't necessarily put much on his plus-minus. He's more there to be a bruiser anyway. Like, the 51 penalty minutes is actually rather high for the NCAA. Yeah, it is. So, you know what you're getting. Yep. Uh, mean, nasty truculence. Um, looking around at some commentators online who've seen him, they're saying he's almost like David Wolf on the blue line. Just what the doctor ordered. 
it'll it'll be good to see that. So Matt, we've uh, we've gone a long way this season with the Flames, and you know, gone through some highs and lows. Um, currently, the Flames are again riding high on a seven-game uh, series. We did the math. Uh, the the last series started the sixth of March, ended the nineteenth of March. Flames won that series again four to three, which would be a seven game series for the playoffs and puts them at an eight to two current record for the season. And when I'm thinking about this team and kind of where they are and where they've gone, it's interesting because if you if you take a look at um, the roster when we started this podcast after the last lockout in uh, 2004, there's been a lot of change. And to me, it seems almost like there's been more change than other rebuilding teams. It seems like we've shipped out a lot of guys, but I haven't looked to back that up. Yeah, and we started this back in January 2013, I think was our first episode. Oh, sorry, yeah, 2013, not 20, 2004, my bad. Yeah, and the team was basically at the tail end of the Jerome McGinley era when we started, and... Yeah, we've gone through probably the fastest rebuild in history. Looking at the roster, uh, at least the roster from that season according to HockeyDB.com, which lists everyone who played for the team that year, um, 29 players have moved on since then. Four of the five top scorers that year, Camilleri, Aginla, Stemniak, and Glenn Cross, have all been moved. The only guy left in that top five was Alex Tangay. and Or, sorry, not Alex Tangay, Yari Hoodler. And uh, the only players still left from that team uh, that are active are Hoodler, Stajan, Weidman, Backlund, Geo, Brody, and Byron. And you could say Lance Buma. He was hurt all year, so he didn't really play. But he was in the Flames organization at that point as well. Yeah, just a little bit of turnover. And, of course, we also lost a potential Hall of Fame goaltender in Kipper. So just kind of weird to look back and see, I mean, see some of the names that were on the team that year. Guys like, you know, Steve Bajen. Um, I, I remember fondly now looking back that, wow, yeah, that's right. They did sign him. Tim Jackman played for the team. Uh, Roman Shervenka was on the team that year. That was kind of a failed experiment. Um, you know, Ben Street, Anton Babchuk, like a lot of flames that I haven't thought of in a while and I've tried to get out of my head. Yeah, I still remember that two-goal game that Steve Bajan had in the end of the year against Detroit that ended up getting us into sixth in order to uh, take Sean Monaghan. So, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it, it all worked out. But I just, you know, and again, I haven't gone back to look it up, but it seems like there's been a lot of turnover since then, and maybe more than most teams, but I think that was the year that the Flames really realized we have to blow it up. And, I mean, that's the year we moved Jerome McGinley, we moved Jay Bowmeister, we moved Blake Como. Um, you know, and to me, if I look at that year, that was when the transition happened, the year that they said, okay, we got to rebuild here. Well, anytime that you're going into a rebuild situation, you pretty much have to nuke the entire team. And yeah. it wasn't working, and it was the same recipe of close enough but not good enough to actually get anywhere. And like we've even seen this year with uh, Colorado how they've struggled with the Ginla and Tange and are in 10th currently and are going to likely miss again. It just, whatever it is, it just wasn't working and you need new people. And I don't think anybody would have was a fan of having to trade Aginla and Bo Meester and losing Kipper and all that. It sucks, it's hard, but, you know, we're reaping the benefits now with Monaghan, Goudreau, and a whole bunch of other players. So just because it, there was some short-term pain doesn't mean that it wasn't a good thing. You know, and it's funny, too, when I look back at that roster and I look back at the tr at the transactions made that year, none of the players that are acquired for Jerome Ginla directly, none of the players that were acquired directly for Jay Bomeister. I think arguably you could say have helped the Flames cause this year. I mean, yeah, we saw Poirier come up. He played a couple of good games, but I wouldn't call him a, a you know a key to the Flames' success so far. So I think it's interesting too that we got rid of you know two of the most valuable pieces this team had, and we've been able to rebuild kind of in spite of getting a really awesome piece back for those guys, or at least a piece that was able to contribute now. 
Well, even uh, deleting Tange from the roster uh, and Sarich in the David Jones Shane O'Brien deal, like it, Jones didn't really produce much of anything either. So we Jones lost. Been the, hurt. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this year he's been good, but you know, deleting another top scorer from your team with getting nothing in return that's helped. Uh, it's just weird how Calgary's managed to turn everything around considering like usually you have to replace a player with a like player in order to get results and well, that's it. And generally when you move a top roster player like a Gindler Bowmeister, you're getting a roster player back. Yeah, and we're we haven't and it's kind of bizarre how like we haven't even really signed any top tier free agents either like mason raymond's pretty much the only guy since we started the rebuild that's come in and he's more of a glenn cross replacement than anything and you know i i hate to make this comparison you know i'm knocking on wood as i say this but if you look at the flames roster this year it looks like almost to me a group of leftovers it almost looks like kind of leftovers from all these other teams that didn't want these guys and we've kind of put together this you know band of outcasts in a way and it reminds me a lot of and there i am knocking on wood r04 roster which to me looked a lot the same way yeah it reminds me a lot of uh my favorite movie the dirty dozen so you know a ragtag group uh cast-offs as you said that is finding success together yeah and you know to me i find that interesting like when i look at the roster from uh you know 2013 it looks like a roster that should have success i mean mike camilleri lee stepniak alex tange yari hoodler curtis glencross matt stajan jerome mcginla dennis weidman uh backland bowmeister giordano brody berchi butler como you know, Horak, um, all these guys, and it's it's a roster that you think would have better success than the names you see on the roster this year. Oh, yeah. Well, like, that's why you and I both thought that the Flames would be in competition with Edmonton, where they are now fighting for McDavid. Because uh, on paper, this team does not look very good. And yet... Uh, they've surpassed every expectation. For sure. Some interesting notes as I look down this uh, 2013 roster. Would you believe that Roman Cervenka had a better season points-wise than Michael Backlund? No. Cervenka wasn't as bad as uh, memory would dictate. He was a pretty good player. It's just he didn't quite find his niche I think he was also getting played in the wrong situations. I think he could still be okay here as kind of a fourth-line centerman. Uh, but I remember, if my memory serves me correctly, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I think he was getting a lot of uh, two and even sometimes line one slots. Yeah, he was playing with Hoodler for most of the year. Yeah. And, you know, looking at the roster there and looking at the players we did move, one of the biggest surprises of guys that are still here has got to be Matt Stajan. I think every year... We think Matt Stage is not going to be a flame at the end. Not going to be a flame at the end. And every year he manages to stick around. So good for Matt Stajan for cementing that spot on this roster. Yeah, Stajan's a good player in that he, you can throw him out with anybody and he'll do a good job. And if you throw him in a fourth line role, he plays a very good sound defensive fourth line role situation you put him out with some skilled wingers he'll contribute some offense so it's good and that's the type of veteran leader that you would like in the roster not necessarily as a guy to rely on to get 40 50 points but just someone there uh, you need that and that's where i think there's been some maybe mismanagement is the right word of matt stajan i think he's being paid like a first line centerman so I think people have expected him to be that. And I think they've expected him to be, you know, when Jerome was here, the setup man for Jerome. And they've expected him to be a top sniper. And like you said, he's not. To me, he's a depth centerman. He's a great depth veteran centerman. But he's not a guy you look at as one of your, you know, top three, top four scorers. So I think that he's overpaid for the job he does. But I'm 
I, well, when I look back, I, I wasn't a fan of his when we got him, but I'm becoming more and more of a fan of his every year. Yeah, he's getting paid $3 million, which, if you look at the cap being I around... I he's still making like five and a quarter. No, he got okay. re-signed for four years at three at three point one six. That's if I not recall. too bad right now, then. Yeah, like if you consider the cap being seventy million dollars, he he's making less than what an average player would make if you divide that cap by twenty. Okay, yeah, at, at three three something, he's okay. I thought he was still making like five and a quarter, and to me, that would be quite a bit overpaid. Oh yeah, well of course. If, I think that's what he's making in his first contract here. I think it was four five, four four oh, point okay. five, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I just you know going back and looking at that roster, I got to give Stajan kudos for sticking around that long because he's kind of. When I look at the team, I know we talked about this when Glenn Cross was traded, but Stajan is really the last of that old guard. Yeah, and how would you say? Glenn Cross, he seems to be more of a player that needs to be a go-to guy, more so than Stajan, where, how would you say, leadership-wise, I would not consider Glenn Cross a leader, whereas Stajan, I think he has that leadership ability in him. Yeah, I don't want to slay Glenny, but he seems like the guy who wants to be the face of the team, where Stajan seems like he wants to be a player on the team. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm... He's okay to not take the credit. He just wants to go out every night and play and help the team however he can. If he's not scoring all the goals, that's fine with him, as long as he's contributing to a good night. Exactly. And where Glenn Cross, if he wasn't getting the ice time or whatever he would kind of almost like pout a bit and you know i i think we have to ask ourselves a little bit and you know we can get into this another time really in depth if we want to but how much of that is perhaps curtis glencross naturally and how much of that was the system that curtis glencross came up in here in calgary i think he came up when you know jerome and those guys were here and maybe that's what he was used to of well if you pouted you got your way yeah then that's true cuz it was a very much a collection of individuals under the previous regime yeah. where now it's more of a the letter on the front of the jersey is more important than the name on the back yeah and, and not only the name on the back but the number next to the dollar sign on the contract as well true um you know in the past it was well we're paying you know so and so so much money so he's got to be on the first line and you know, this year we're seeing guys on the first line who aren't the top paid players. Exactly. Um, speaking of Glenny, just wanted to check while you're talking how he's doing, because I haven't really watched the Capitals this season. He's played nine games in uh, Washington, four goals and two, and two assists, so he's got six points and he's a minus one. So six points in nine games, sounds like he's finding a bit of a groove there, which is good. Yeah, I, I don't want anybody to think I'm slagging on Glenn Cross. You know, like I'm ho- hoping that he has a very successful postseason and gets a good contract next year. It's just, you know, I'd prefer staging, that's all. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's slagging on him, but I think like, you know, we said when Jerome left and when uh, Bo Meester left, we wish them all the best of luck, but it's time to move on from Calgary. Exactly. And, you know, I, I wish Glenn Cross all the best success this year, pendants in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, true. Because I really, if he's doing well, I don't want to meet him in the playoffs until if we can make it there the very last round if we have to see him. Because I think that Glenn Cross could be one of these secret weapons for the Capitals. Yeah, well, it, just as we've seen Tangay, like back when uh, he was with Colorado the first time, it seemed that Tangay would always find a way to score on Calgary. And now that he's with Colorado again, uh, it's the same old story. So, yeah, no, I, I think Lundcross is a good player. I wish him all the best. Um, I hope he's not in our division wherever he signs because I really don't want to see him against the Flames for that reason. But, yeah, I think he's a, he's a good player. It's just time for him to move on. Oh, yeah. Well, Matt, there's a bit of a sad story we wanted to cover this week. Um, a site that we've been fans of since, I think, before we even started the podcast. One of the sites that really came out of nowhere in the NHL, um, as far as media reporting and all that, was CapGeek. And I know when the salary cap first came out, I had a hard time figuring out who was making what and who had how much room and that sort of thing. And CapGeek, for me, was always 
I mean, I'm a stats buff. You know, I used to do web analytics for for a living, and I've always loved numbers and stats and that sort of thing. So I always found CapGeek fascinating when I could run these data models against, you know, contracts and uh, salary caps and all that. Well, some people know that CapGeek um, ceased it running earlier this year, and we just found out that the creator of CapGeek, the founder, Matthew West, um, has passed away after a two and a half year battle with colon cancer. So I think I speak for everybody in hockey media when I say that he'll be missed um, and his site will be missed. I don't think people realize just how much went into running Cap Geek. Yeah, I hate cancer and... I don't yeah. think you're alone in that one. No, it, like it's so frustrating to see people that are doing good in the world, not just Matt West for Cap Geek, but in all sectors of life, getting years of their lives robbed of them for something so stupid and it, i liked cap geek and like most hockey fans it was such a great site to figure out who was doing what and how much they were getting paid and who was the good upcoming UFAs and all that. And, And, you know, to me, that's always stuff that the hardcore hockey geeks, if you will, were doing on their own. Like, I remember, you know, before the lockout, going to places like, you know, calgarypuck.com, and, you know, the nerds were going through that. But I think for the first time, CapGeek made... I'm trying to think how to say this. CapGeek made the business side of hockey accessible and interesting to a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. You know, I know I'd go on my phone and I'd go, well, how much is this guy making? Whether he's one of our guys or someone on another team. And it just, it made it kind of interesting to see, yeah, who's making what and how long are they under contract and what were their previous contracts? And it even showed you how much this guy's made over the course of his career, which I often found fascinating to go look at. Yeah, exactly. And like, if you were looking up like trade ideas and concepts like, oh, well, this guy fit under the salary cap this that the next thing and i think what matt doesn't get what matt west doesn't get a lot of credit for is he wasn't just you know putting together a spreadsheet i've heard people say well it's just a spreadsheet and you know it's not he had to do a lot of um he had to do a lot of investigative reporting i guess in a way to figure out these contracts because the nhl doesn't actually make contracts available they don't tell you what these players are making and what the exact terms are so a lot of these contracts, he had to use his connections and go dig and figure out what the contract was. I mean, they'll tell you how long it was, but they don't generally tell you exactly for how much. And also finding out things like, you know, does this guy have a limited no trade or a full no trade or a no movement? So I think, you know, Matthew West doesn't sometimes get credit for doing a lot of that digging. He will definitely be missed by all hockey fans. You know, and everyone in the media, if you listen to anyone in the hockey media, from the, you know, guys on Fan 960 to the Calgary Sun to, you know, TSN, everybody says they use that site because it was the definitive guide for what we do. And I think it changed the way hockey was reported because we were all going to, and there's not many times, you know, there's multiple sites for stats and that sort of thing, the NHL, Hockey DB, Hockey Reference, but that was the one place we all went for salary information exactly i don't think anyone will ever be able to duplicate cap geek but i think there's definitely a void in the market for you know a similar service and we're seeing some sites come out and um try to fill that we've seen nhl numbers jump into the fold and even nhl numbers is set on their own site you know they'll never be able to be what cap geek was um we've seen eklund's hockey buzz and their cap central page uh doing a lot of the same things what do you think it would take for one of those sites or another site to really come out and become the new front runner in this area? Well, they would have to find a way to get the connections that Matt West did in the NHL or wherever they managed to he managed to find insight into the details of contracts. Like, you can find the numbers quite easily, but not any of the surrounding details that West did. Yeah, and even his historical, you know, modeling of going back and looking at past contracts and that sort of thing, I always found awesome. And also the the fact that, oh, I guess they, so I'm on the NHLPA site and they do list team salaries and I believe player salaries, so I might be wrong. Yeah, 
I'm wrong, sorry. The NHL does list how much a player is making. I thought they didn't, but they do. So, you know, it's more than just going to NHLPA and grabbing that information. There was a lot of data modeling there. And I'm hoping at some point um, Matt West's estate will release the Cap Geek data into the open source or somewhere free for other sites to take and work with. Because it would really be sad to lose all that data that's already there. Yeah. I, well, I hope that uh, the NHL does something to sort of like memorialize him in some way, shape, or form. I don't know exactly how you would do that or Yeah, I, I mean, the form. only way they could do that would be an eight, a Hall of Fame nomination. I'm not sure he's Hall of Fame quality. As much as I appreciate what he's done, if I look at the names in the Hall of Fame, I'm not sure he should go in there. Yeah, I don't know. Nothing against Matt, but... Yeah, I don't know exactly what you would do in that regard, but... I mean, there is a uh, Professional Hockey Writers Association, which is a collective of the pro hockey writers, and they have different awards um, that they give out every year. Um, and they also vote on awards every year. They vote on the Hart Trophy, the Norris Trophy, the Calder Trophy, the Bing Trophy, the Selkie Trophy, the Mastern Trophy, and the Clancy Trophy. So maybe it's time to kind of set up an award within the hockey writing community for you know the guy who is doing the best work around salary cap information or even uh some like secondary award like for like most innovative new reporting or whatever who knows yeah no that could be a good one too or you know maybe even having some sort of a an honorarium or a scholarship in his name for stuff like that of hey here's something that's interesting and new let's help fund these guys so they can get bigger but, yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I never met Matthew personally. I exchanged a few emails with him and his team at hockey uh, at Cap Geek over the years. Um, I offered years ago to help them build a mobile app of their site before they had one. And it's, it's tough to lose that resource. It's tough to lose anyone. But um, I lost my grandfather to colon cancer, so I know how rough it can be. And I hate to hear other people that have passed away from the same thing. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that as medical advances like i watched that documentary on vice uh curing cancer i'm hoping that the progress that they are making with new treatments can start coming out and hopefully helping more people survive such a wicked disease and ugh, so frustrating it is, but from from our family, the West family, um, you know, we we sincerely mourn your loss, and uh, you know, the loss will be felt here at Fireside Chat because we've lost one of our great resources. Yeah, and just want to also wish say my condolences as well to the West family. Ugh, I hate when people get lost for no reason. And yeah. it, you know, it's just so senseless. It is. Well, why don't we uh, move on a bit? I know it's hard to follow that, but why don't we look ahead to the next week of Flames hockey? Uh, four games in the next week. We've got the Stars on Wednesday. We've got Minnesota coming in on Friday, and then we have a back-to-back -back Sunday, Monday with uh, Minnesota or with Nashville and Dallas again. So we got eight uh, last week. Let's look at our points last week. We had eight points on the table. I guessed four. I was a bit of a pessimist. You guessed six. We split the difference at five, so neither of us get a point, so it still stands 4-2 in my favor. Another eight-point week. Matt, how do you think we're going to do? I'm going to go with what you predicted last week, four points. So you think we're going to go 500 on the week? Yeah, I think we beat Dallas twice and lose the other two. We kind of have to go 500 on the week, don't we? Like, if we can't go 500 this week, that might be the end of our postseason chance. Yeah. If we lose three or four, we're pretty much screwed. I'm going to go... You know what? We're going to swap what we had last week. I think we're going to do six points. I think we're going to take Dallas twice and Minnesota. Okay. So we'll swap our predictions from last week. So you thought we are going to do... Six points last week, and I'm going six this week, and you picked four, and I did four last week. So Yeah, we watch us see. hit five again. <laughs> Probably. 
And this is our second last seven game series of the year. So we have one. Well, this will actually be the last seven game series. Sorry, we just finished the second last. There's nine games left. So this will be the last full seven game series of the year that we're heading into. So it's getting down to the wire. Yeah. Well, basically, now Vancouver, Winnipeg, LA, and us are going to comprise the last three playoff spots. So. Hopefully the other teams can actually start losing a game here and there. Like I know Vancouver's won a few. LA they Yeah, LA, doesn't it suck that everybody's getting hot right when you need them to go cold? Yeah, like Winnipeg's on a five game winning streak and Andre Pavlik is playing like Carey Price. Like can some of you teams go away? <laughs> you know? Like mm-hmm. uh, I'd like the Flames to, you know, if they lose, it not be the end of their season, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was kind of hoping that some of these teams would just fizzle and it would give us an easy run to the postseason. Yeah, like at least give us some breathing room so if we do actually lose a game here and there, it's not, uh, you know, oh no, now we have to win out just to... Exactly. LA, Vancouver, <laughs> you guys have been in the playoffs lots. So why don't you just give us a chance? Yeah. Exactly. You can go again next year. We don't care. Just let us get in this year. Yeah. <laughs> Daryl, do us a favor. Well, wouldn't that be amusing if uh, at the end of the season, because we play them in our second last game, if uh, we can do to Los Angeles what we did to Ginla last night? That would be good. Yeah, can I end their season off? Yeah. You know, speaking of Daryl Sutter, I noticed that one of his brothers on TSN, or not TSN Sportsnet, as a commentator a couple weeks ago, I never thought I'd see the day that a Sutter was hired as a as one of the commentators or analysts. I thought that was kind of amusing. Yeah, oh, I'll say they're they're not the guys that are most known for being um, camera ready and you know able to talk eloquently about our game. Yeah, they kind of just make snide comments at the media. <laughs> or, or as Daryl used to kind of mumble around and nobody knows what he's saying. I still think that's how he got some of his great deals done. All good. <laughs> Well, Matt, we will uh, see you after this four-game uh, week for the Flames where they head back on the road for three of those games and start off a uh, five-game uh, road stand. Yeah, do or die this week, that's for sure. If if we've ever had a week when we need the Sea of Red to be in full force, um, you know, both at home and cheering when they're on the road, it's now. Yep. So Sea of Red, engage. <laughs> Yeah, go Flames, go everyone, and go have Flames, a good go. week, and see you next time. We'll talk to you next Bye. week. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.